talk about that. Okay. Um, who, who learned about Delaware statutory trust for me? Who was in that class? Raise your hand high. One, two, three. Were you in it? <laughs> yeah. I know. And I thought Gabe, because Gabe, Gabe is like, Gabe is like one of my best fans. Like every time I talk, he records me. <laughs> so when I'm talking, I'm like, where's Gabe? I miss him. <laughs> okay, so Delaware Statutory Trust. Let me explain this to you. Um, attend some, first of all, let me start off by saying someone is gonna pay, someone's gonna pay tax. And that's the, the, the law, the, the, right? You don't escape death or taxes. That's the quote, right? We don't escape death or taxes. So someone's gonna pay. A 1031 exchange is just a tool to kick the, like, it's my goal that my kids pay inheritance tax when I die, right? They're going to pay tax, not me. Like, while I'm alive, they could, they, they're, my kids will pay inheritance tax. They could do that. I don't, when I'm dead, I won't care. But when I'm alive, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah the inheritance tax is a, it's, a, it's the same as capital gains tax. It's a little higher, actually, 2% higher. So, <laughs> yeah right yeah 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 i remember i remember <laughs> yeah she's never gonna die <laughs> yeah I, I i i just want you i want you i want you guys to know like i want you guys to know that like um i i shared this with all of you before but my living trust um i when i went to divorce i dissolved it because you know and now i have a, i haven't put together a new one because i was making some decisions as to where i'm going to invest or what i'm going to do Right. And, um, and so I was going to uh, try, should I leverage this property? But I bought more property and stuff. So I wanted to wait. So now I've um, engaged, I gave you guys an option of a, of a, of a, of a gentleman that does it very inexpensively, like for less than a thousand dollars, we'll get a living trust in place. I also just got an attorney. Um, I can't use him because my situation is very complicated because I have different businesses and properties. So I need an actual attorney to do mine. Um, the, so I have an attorney, amazing attorney referred by my, my financial planner. And he's very inexpensive. He's only 2000 flat fee. And he's going to come in February. He just confirmed this morning and teach you guys all about estate planning, tr living trust and everything. So he's going to come here in person. So don't miss that class. Cause I'm like, he's driving up from Camarillo cause he's award-winning. He's top 1% in his industry. And um, so I, as you know, I only bring the like level 10 people. So he's going to drive hours to come to teach us cause he does everything virtually anyways but he's gonna come, so make sure that you have all your questions and you show up next month, please, yeah? Okay, cool. So uh, Delaware, this, this, is, this is a tool that, that you guys do not know about. If you learn this, you can knock on doors or you can do what Crystal was gonna do, which was a very good idea. She was gonna go show up to all the, um, you know, on Walking Farm with Lisa Favorite, it tells you who the absentee owners are. She was gonna call, um, knock on those renters and say, hey, why are you paying $3,000 rent, buy it, you know? Um, so, so that, that's, that was a good idea, but I told her, no, uh, we're a listing organization. We go after listings because then listings have babies. So your folk, if you're going to go after something, your energy should always go after listings. Do we love buyers? Yes. Do buyers pay the bills? Yes. But you guys know that it takes 60 hours to service a buyer in this market. Okay. And it takes 15 hours to service a listing. Does that make sense? Yeah, if not more, especially if you have FHA, you know? Yeah, and this market, is, it's, it's still competitive. It's very low inventory right now, okay? I listed a home in Moreno Valley that no comps were around above 395, and my clients, like, we listed at 429, and I have, it, within 24 hours, I have offers at 475 in Moreno Valley. I'm like, <laughs> the market's crazy again, okay? Mobile's a good place. That's a, one of the top agents in Mobile is sitting in the room, so he knows, Okay. Okay, <laughs> Delaware Statutory Trust. Got it? Okay, what this is, is that uh, there's a 1031 exchange. So when someone wants to sell an investment home, um, they have 45 days to identify a property, right, Jonathan? And then they have how many? 100, 180? 180 to close escrow. And by the way, 45 does not mean an escrow. It just means identify a property. You you cut that? Identify meaning that they could not, they don't, they do not have to actually buy it or be an escrow. They just have to give an address, in other words. Okay. But they have to close it. And then what happens is that the proceeds, so if they if they have a rental that bought a 200, I need to stop being frugal around here and try to invest in some markers. Okay. Okay. 
my 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 model is we can't afford it. No, it's too much money. Okay, you guys did okay. okay. Yeah, good. <laughs> you guys, you go, you build wealth one dollar at a time. You go broke one dollar at a time. Okay, watch every dollar. Anyways, so two hundred, they sold it for two hundred. The two hundred thousand dollars to avoid paying taxes today. Why would someone do this? <clears throat> I gave the example of my rental in Corona, my my condo. Condo Corona bought it one seventy nine, right? Balance, I can't. I think it's eighty two. Balance is eighty two today. Okay, um, worth four twenty five. I'm looking at the numbers with my with my financial. I was in my financial planner yesterday all day. Okay, so um, so four twenty five. How much equity do I have on it? Potentially. <laughs> What's 425 minus 82? <laughs> so we'll say 300. I'm in a room with a lot of realtor professionals, you guys. <laughs> okay, three, 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 343. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Phil, I, I love when Phil's in here because he makes, he makes me hella nervous because he knows way more than me. Okay, three, 343. I have 343 equity, yes? So as before the, the rental increase, my um my my cash flow from this property five eighty nine a month. Okay, that's going up February first. But right now, this is my cash flow from that property five eighty nine a month. I didn't care because guess what? Look how much I owe. Earlier in the year, I told you guys I um took an owner distribution from one of my businesses. Of 115, that, that means owner distribution means that after taxes, that's how much I profited after paying the IRS. That was my net. And now I, I just, I was going to use the 115 to pay the 82 off. And just so I can increase my, my 1589 to my to 1589 a month. But I was going to use that money for that. Instead, I used this money and bought the house in Covina for 475, right? That is worth literally seven eighty five right now. I bought in July, so look how much equity I have there. My net worth went up, yeah. So, but now I still owe here like three whatever three eighty, right? I owe three eighty, and uh, the payment on this with taxes and insurance is a one percent tax rate. It's twenty one twenty three, and we, I rented it for thirty three hundred. They just moved in, okay. So yeah, so I have twelve hundred cash flow here, right? And but but the reason I made this move is because look how much look here look at this look look at this what's the difference between these two four hundred thousand equity so my net worth went up four hundred thousand got it so this is a good move yes yes you guys will do that okay great so I'm glad I didn't use this money to pay this off that wouldn't have been smart right I instead used now the money's working for me now I still have four hundred thousand I still have cash flow twelve hundred here so my, I'm putting this money to work anyways right. So this is where I want to get all of you to, to buy properties because you can get there because I borrowed 8,000 to get into real estate 10 years ago. I had no money. So if I could do it, you could do it. And I'm here to teach you how I did it, okay? So that's a different situation. Back to this scenario. 179, 82,000. So now, right now, I'm cash flowing 589. What I can do, and you only could do this, a Delaware statutory trust, when you... You can only do a Delaware statutory trust in a 1031 exchange. You cannot do it from a primary owner occupier. Okay. What it is is that Walmart is owned 40% by a Delaware statutory trust, Amazon. So what happens is that you, in essence, own invest in this company that has they have a 5% cap rate. Some have up to nine. So when you sell your house, you call it the Delaware statutory rep, which I am friends with, like the Adrian and Natalia that came here from Hawaii. They introduced me to him. He lives in Hawaii, but he does it all over the 50 states. He's an, a PSI LS grad too. And he, he, only, he only specializes in Delaware statutory trust. That's all he does. And he does it at a very high level. You call him and he'll say, okay, Amazon, you could do Amazon, you could do Walmart, you could do a storage unit, you could do um, um, Blackstone, which owns a lot of companies. They just bought Sphinx, right? So they'll tell you what company you could invest in at the time. So the way it works is, me, what I can do is and say, okay, this property, okay. Um, some sometimes you have owners that sell and and have bad credit. They go through a divorce. They have equity, but they don't have credit to buy right now. Yes, 
you have people that are elderly and don't want to manage tenants anymore. Yes? So think of those clients when they own more than one home. What you do is I, I could sell this property in Corona for 425. I could net, let's just say 300,000, right? And then I could put it in a Delaware statutory trust instead of buying another home, which is not credit driven. It's just money driven. You, you can have a 400 FICO or a bankruptcy today and still do a Delaware statutory trust. Now I'm going to put the 300,000 in there. And now I'm going to get, instead of 589 passive income a month, I'm getting 1500 a month because it's a 5% cap rate in the Walmart scenario. If it's a seven or 8%, then I can get, you know, six, seven, you know, more, 2000 a month, 1800 a month. So um, a Delaware statutory trust. <laughs> <coughs> how did you get from 589 Because, right, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, because right now, like I own, so I bought that property for 179. I bought it 10 years ago in 2011 or 12. Okay. It's worth 425 now. It's a condo in Corona. As it, when I bought it, it was already below market, like 40 grand. Okay. I owe 82,000 on it. That's my balance. Okay. I owe 82. It's worth 425. So I have 343,000 in equity. But I'm using a, 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 a number like this just to make it easier to know. So if I sell this home, I have $300,000 profit. Because this is my investment home, I'd be subject to capital gains tax, right? right. To avoid that, um, I, I, I don't want to sell. I don't want the money because I, I cash, I get $589 a month right now in positive cash flow, okay? Because I have like, my payment is like 900 on that property. And then I have um, HOA deuce. So my, I, all, I, all I profit is $1,589 a month right now, cash flow. Got it. However, if I if I sell it and get the three hundred thousand and put it in a Delaware statutory ten thirty one exchange, now I get to um, now I'm going to cash flow fifteen hundred a month, and I don't have to worry about tenants. I don't have to worry about vacancies. I don't have to worry about repairs. There's pros and cons to that, right? Properties keep appreciating, so there's pros to this. Yeah, it, 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 this doesn't keep appreciating, right? I'm just getting a, a return on my money. Does that make sense? But th there's pros and cons to that. Okay. Yeah, so the, wh why would someone do this? Why? Because there's um, our agent. She's not here right now. Oh, no, she's not. LaShonda, she called me, and she's doing a, uh, this. And that's why I thought, oh, I told her, but I haven't told the whole office. She's doing it because she doesn't want to deal with this property. She's owned it for 10 years, and her last tenant, she has $15,000 in damage and an eviction. And she's just over it. She doesn't want to deal with tenants. But she doesn't want to get taxed almost, you know, whatever, whatever the ta whatever the capital gains tax is now. I don't know, twenty eight to forty percent. I don't know, whatever. Okay, um, she doesn't want to get taxed, so she's doing a Delaware statutory trust. She called Kyle already. What is it? It's twenty eight to thirty eight right now. Twenty eight to thirty eight. Yeah. So I'm gonna go around for. Yeah. So it's, so she doesn't want. Oh, our attorney's here. Yeah. Hi. Delaware. Yeah. Yeah. Our De our Delaware statutory trust. Our Delaware statutory trust. Um, she's doing it. And she already called Kyle and all that other stuff. So she's a perfect example. She's like, I don't want, Sophia, what do I do? I don't want to own this home. She goes, and I don't want to get taxed. And I said, I have the solution for you. And she's really excited. She's doing it. And then, you know, when you sell your own home at the lakes, you represent, you only pay a $500 administration fee as long as the, the property has to be in your name. It can't be a friend or a family, you know what I mean? But it's in your name. So she's only going to pay us $500. And she's, she could, you know, save money on selling her own home. And doing it all into her Delaware statutory trust. Is there an investment limit on that? No. So you can go anywhere. You could go for uh, to billions. Yeah. Billions. So yeah, you can. There's no limit. Uh, you you well, ask how. Yeah. Um. I um. Adrian Lally went through a divorce uh, years ago, and she did seven hundred thousand when she sold the Florida property and put in a Delaware statutory trust. Can we get your money out. Well. Whenever you want. Either. Hey, cash me out. Cash you out. That's because because you because forty percent of Walmart. People don't know about this. See, Mr. Phil, people, people don't know about this, right, Phil? See? And, and, and the reason, the, because I hang around with multi-millionaires, like, I learn all kinds of stuff. Like, they, like this is very important. So, yeah, so I, who wants Kyle's number to ask him more questions? I, I, I'm going to have him teach a class. I'm going to have him, I'll teach, have him teach a class in February, too, okay? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, he's, uh, I'll give you his number today. No, yeah. Yeah, so this, this is how it is. Yeah, have him come in Sophia. Yeah. There is no date. You can have it here for as long as you want it. Yes. 
So the pro I wish I could do it with cash okay, I have in the bank. Right, I'll hold on. <laughs> but you can. It has to be a 10 okay. exchange. I'll wait a little longer. I'll just keep it on and, and a hundred percent cash flow. It's real, it just shows up in your bank account. But you have to have a sold the property. The prop you, you started when you saw the property. So it's really, really, it's an option, you know. And by the way, the 1031 exchange attorney does it too, Steve, that I brought here. He mentioned it when he got the class. He said Delaware Statutory Trust. However, um, Kyle does only this. So his relationship, oh, you guys have no idea. He plays at a whole another level. I don't know that. I don't know that, but I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's, it, it's, you can win into your living trust. That's why I was talking to my financial planner. Yesterday. This yeah. may be biased, you guys, but I think we have the best OP in the world. I'm not just you know, saying. <laughs> remember where I'm going to go this month. I'm going to go like to the to meet with like the staff, my billionaire boss babe, like this month. I have all this, and I'm going to come back to teach you guys everything. My friends that do everything. She's going to go on YouTube. Home. All right. Yeah. Sophia is the OP right. here. Can I be the legs? Yeah. All right. And I know everything she knows. Plus more. Yeah. I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> Who's going to come to that class next month, you guys? Wasn't this a great impromptu like learning lesson? All right. Without further ado, John Mansour, our legal attorney, is here. So please come on up. We're going to mic you up. Thank you so much. And then we're going to mic you up. And we have a Zoom going on right now. We have about like, what, 10 people on? Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. It's okay. You guys mind that he was late? I can do that. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah so. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Maybe you should get up in front of the <laughs> You're like me. You like to hear yourself talk like me. Yeah, let's get myself talk. Yeah, I apologize. I just was caught up with a bunch of clients who, where we, essentially what happened is San, Ber San Bernardino suspended all jury trials um, <laughs> for this month. Like they suspended jury trials actually um, right now. So no jurors are coming in to, to, to so surgery. Do I have to go? San Bernardino or Riverside? Riverside? Riverside too has suspended jury trials. So do I, do I have to go? I would probably call. <laughs> but um but a bunch of clients are concerned about that so i was spending all morning just talking to clients, clients about that um and i got caught up in just conversations and i left the house at what time did i leave the house god i thought i left in time 12 15 no 11 15 it took me forever to get here um all right so um i wanted to talk to you guys about the new contract what's going on in tenancy and a few things that um that new laws that may apply to the realtors that that are on the books for 2022 okay so the new contract essentially does not there's no major changes in a new contract essentially what the new contract does is it has these tables at the very front of it that kind of makes things a little bit simpler uh that way anyway this it went from like 10 pages to 16 pages right like every year it seems to be adding more pages and i don't know when you guys you know got into the business but when i I, mean, I remember like 20 years ago when I was looking at the car contract, was it like five pages or six pages, maybe? I started two pages. Two pages. <laughs> uh, people tell me stories that they used to write the contract on, you know, freehand on, on carbon carbon paper, you know. Those days are those days are long gone. Now it's 16, it makes 16 pages long. But what it does is that it kind of puts it up front um, for everybody to see in boxes, in these little boxes here for the first few pages. Um, all the different details about the contract, which is kind of nice, right? Uh, the two changes that I want to point to here, which are not huge changes, but I want to just make sure you guys know. Number one, remember like there was an old, there was a, there was a section in the old contract if, for example, regarding deposits and escrow being involved in that, like it said something like, you know, if the deposit's not being released by one side or the other, they can make a demand on escrow and escrow has 10 days to, to correspond with the other side. And then if they don't correspond, escrow can, can release the money. Does that ring a bell? That was like yes, a four, yes, yes. 14H. Yes. That's gone. Oh. Right. And the reason that's gone is because <laughs> nobody was complying with it, right? No escrow could not comply with the provision because they're not party to the contract. So it's a big headache for everybody. So that's that's pretty much gone. The other thing is, is that it specifies in here that the contingencies are a little bit more specified in this contract. So it was always true that the buyer has other contingencies aside from inspection, appraisal, and and um, and loan, right? Right. Those are the big three. But buyers have other contingencies essentially. And and if you look at the second page of the contract, it talks about loan appraisal, investigation, um, international access, uh, informational access to property, uh, review of seller documents, 
preliminary report, common interest disclosures, uh, review of, of leased or leaned items, sale of buyers. Pro so essentially it has other contingencies in here that are interlaid in this contract that are not specified very well in the old contract. But that language essentially tracks the, um, the, CA, the uh, cancellation, the, the um, removal of a contingency form. What is it called? The CR form? So it tracks the CR form. So they're trying to match it up with the CR form is what they're trying to do. All right. So those are kind of the two minor changes that happen here, except for all these different boxes. Does anybody have any, any questions about this contract specifically? Aside from it being a lot longer than it used to be. Any so so the, the main change was that that change 14H was gone. And, and, um... and essentially they're specifying these other buyer contingencies very specifically. Okay. So I don't know if you, I mean, if you guys remember the CR form, right? It says like, uh, what are you, what contingencies are you removing? You know, most of the time it says all, you know, people yeah. check all, but it's specified out there. It says like you know, review of documents, things like that. Those are always buyer contingencies, right? So, I mean, if for whatever reason, if you're a listing agent and your seller says, I want to withhold these, these documents, I mean, the, the, talk them out of it because you're going to have to disclose these things eventually, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, common area documents or HOA documents, if you don't disclose them, until later, the buyer still has the right to cancel anyway. You know, it, it from that date, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's new information. So it's not really getting the seller anything by withholding information, you know? Um, so yeah, it extends from that date. It's like five days after that day to cancel. So, you know, so convince your clients to get you all of the disclosures as quickly as possible. Because even if the buyer isn't, you know, maybe not planning on canceling um, for, for whatever reason, Maybe they have some changed circumstances 30 days on the road and they see a document that they'll just say, oh, I'm canceling because of this new document. And then you're going to argue whether the new document is material to the transaction or not, whether it's, you know, whether it's something that, should, you know, the disclosure was material to the transaction. Who wants to argue that? I mean, it's, it's a tough argument to make, right? So, you know, you, if you don't want, if you want the buyer on the hook as soon as possible, get all the documents to the buyer as soon as possible and follow the timelines as soon as possible, right? I mean, especially right now, there's no reason not to file, follow the timelines from the seller side. You know, sellers are not in a big, in a, you know, in a big hurting for buyers, right? So when you're not hurting for buyers, you got to, you got to make the buyers follow the timeline strictly because you want to cancel as soon as possible and move on to the next deal. If you don't do that and this, the buyer has not removed contingencies for 30 days and all of a sudden the buyer is canceling. You're going to have to break the news to your seller that not only is the buyer canceling, but we can't withhold their deposit because the contingencies were never removed. You don't want to be in that position, right? I'm in a position right now. Um, John, if this is a good example for everybody. Um, I, made an, I made an offer on the property. Um, uh, we did not remove the, the, the loan contingency because at that time... Um, you guys, Tano was getting creative with the financing. Y'all know how he played. Okay? <laughs> so they're self-employed, a few salon owners, and he said, don't remove it yet because he was just trying to make it work just because my clients have their sporadic income. Yeah. He said, don't remove the contingency. So what they did, they sent me an order to perform and a cancellation because I didn't remove the loan contingency. So I, I was scheduled to close December 1st. They canceled to me December 20th. They canceled on me and they put the home back on the market. They had the right to do that. Yeah, they, they moved on, back on the market. We never removed the loan contingency. So what we did is um, I just told the client, look, um, we could be, we, we have to play fair because if we purposely like not give them the cancellation and stop them from selling the home to someone else, we could be liable for punitive damages and legal damages to them for holding the loan. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we decided, okay, let's just let them cancel. We tried our best, whatever. So they canceled. And now um, the, I send the cancellation to them because they, the, the agent emailed me and said, um, please send over cancellation and my seller will, will release the deposit to your client. Right. She sent that in an email. So I trusted her and sent her the cancellation. And now they, uh, they're refusing to release the deposit. For well, $10, they don't have to. but understand something. I mean, you know, I mean, you, yeah. you didn't really do anything wrong because it, whether you trusted her or not, is not the, because the cancellation, is, the cancellation is by one side or okay. the, or the other. It doesn't, you, you know that, yeah. it's not mutual. So the seller can cancel and then withhold deposit anyway. Um, so just because you sent the cancellation, um, does it mean that the, you know, does it mean anything? Cause unless you sign off on a deposit saying this, the deposit is going to the seller. No, so the money's in escrow, yeah. just you guys know, and now my client's like, you see my $10,000, I'm like, it's stuck there. 
Um, so now the um, we tried everything to try to get them to like, hey, what do you want? You know, they're not they completely went dark. So now I think we're just going to my client has to take them to small claims court mm -hmm. or or hire a mediation attorney, which is like two hundred fifty dollars an hour. Well, I wouldn't rec. I mean, for for a small claims amount, I wouldn't recommend mediating. No, because it's it's not worth the money, right? So. If it's within if it's within a small claims amount, uh, then I would just I would, ten thousand. Is it month? Okay, so just so go to small claims. It's the cheapest way to go, because mediator is going to cost you you know it's going to cost you a couple couple of thousand dollars, yeah. and it may not resolve it, because mediation is volu is voluntary in terms of whether people agree to to resolve the case or not. So if they don't resolve it in mediation, they've spent two thousand dollars, then they have to go to arbitration, which is even more expensive. I mean, just, no. <laughs> so, so however, got, what we did is what I did is we got the whole file together for the client. We put all the emails together, put the whole file together, and said, "Here, good luck. Go to small business." <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but let's say that client, the seller, wants to sell a house and they they're in contract. Can they still go forward and sell a the house? They they could sell the house because they that was they could sell the house because they're in escrow with a different escrow company. Okay. See, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but I was a different company. Yes, they could sell. You know, the, the, can, the, the cancellation cancels the contract. The deposit issue doesn't, doesn't have a bearing on whether they can sell or not. I mean, I shouldn't say that. I mean, it's, it's, everything has a bearing on whether they can sell or not. The way I would say it is this. If the buyer cancels, there is no question in my mind that, that, the, that the, the seller can sell to somebody else. There's no question at all. Because once the buyer cancels, they're giving up on the house. And the title company who's, selling, who, who's going to be selling next, you know, the, the, in the next sale, the title company is going to be like, well, the buyer canceled. There is no title claim again for, by the buyer, so we can sell freely. If the seller cancels, sometimes title will be doable or investigation because if if buyer can make a title claim, for example, the seller canceled inappropriately, like the seller says, hey, I want to cancel because I could get more money somewhere else, the, the buyer may still be able to sue under that contract to, to, to enforce the contract and, and title will get concerned about that because they may, you know, they don't want to green light a transaction mm -hmm. to sell to another somebody else if the buyer can still make a title claim. Mm -hmm. Well, can the buyer put a lien or judgment on the property? If they file a lawsuit, yes. They have to file mm -hmm. a lawsuit first. In, in between that time before they sell it? Yes. Yeah, they got to do a less right? Yes. So, but what's the purpose of a deposit if people just walk away or hold? Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about a small subset of issues here. Like the, you know, the minority, like for, you know, when I was in law school, you know, my, con my, uh, my contracts attorney, right. Well, my contracts professor, right. His favorite saying is that, you know, you guys are going to go out of here thinking that every single contract is going to be breached. He goes, no, he goes, 5% of contracts get breached. 95% never get breached and they perform beautifully, but nobody's going to ever tell you that because people come to you with problems, right. Most of the time, there is no issue with the deposit, but you, but the headaches are like the five percent where there are, right? So that's the reason for the deposit is to have some skin in the game and people to, to perform in good faith. Okay, so I don't mean to capture the whole scene. So, no, no, please, that's what he's here. This is all massive. If a buyer puts a deposit up, he is, he's saying, "I promise, I'm going to perform." And here's evidence of it, but via the deposit. Right. The seller says, I'm going to take your deposit. I promise not to sell your property, this property, anybody else, because you put a deposit up. So the buyer has a vested interest in it. If there's a dispute and the separation, the seller says, I'm keeping your deposit, I'm going to sell my house for a rent. What's the buyer, what, what, what recourse does the buyer have? He's got to go to court and do a specific performance. So, it depends on what the buyer wants to do, right? So if the buyer no longer wants the house and the seller canceled, it's pretty clear that the buyer is going to get their money back. So essentially, you know, small claims or, or court action, but they're going to get the deposit back. The, the sword hanging over the seller's head in that situation is attorney fees. Because if it's like a $20,000 deposit or $30,000 deposit, like, and the seller's withholding the deposit, I'm going to go through, we're going to put a lawsuit you know, and we're going to stop um, Illegal, the you know, improperly, you can, they're going to get slammed with attorney fees. Mean? We'll because that's what the contract says. The prevailing party gets attorney fees. Like, that's usually enough to scare people off of that position. You know, when the seller goes to see an attorney, the attorney's going to be like, not only are you going to lose, you, you can't withhold their deposit. You cancel the contract. Okay. You can't withhold their deposit. Your sellers went never, back you know. into escrow when another So buyer. not only are you going to lose, okay, so there because nothing. you cancel the contract before they were contingencies. Or for example, you cancel the contract before the 
so that they can move the on time was with supposed their to be life. Right? Your yeah, so that's, that's what we're talking about. Right? I'm no, not talking about a situation where the seller cancels this, is, this after doesn't have to go to court. I know close of escrow was supposed to happen. The seller says, why aren't you court, performing? So I'm canceling on you because you're not doing client. anything. And oh, by the way, you've removed contingencies. They can put a lien In on that the scenario, the seller can cancel and keep deposits, right? I'm imagining a scenario where the buyer still has time to perform. They have not removed contingencies. And the seller says, I'm selling to somebody else, right? Well, in that situation, the seller is not going to keep, get the money. They're, they're just not going to get it legally. I mean, it's a losing argument for them. So when they go talk to an attorney and say, here's a situation, but I want to keep their money, the attorney's going to be like, not only are you going to lose that, you're going to be paying this person huge amounts of money for attorney fees. That's, I would not recommend it. And I've had those discussions with sellers before, right? Because they say something like, well, you know, the buyer was acting in bad faith and they were causing me emotional distress. I'm like, what? what? It's a contract. You canceled on them. It always did. Always it's just this is it's more specified here, you know. But it always did. It always had, you know. Well, by the way, the other thing, if you guys are noting th changes, it went back from it went back to 17 days on loan. Did you guys notice that? Anybody notice that? Okay, so it was 21 days. It went back to 17 days because they <laughs> they just wanted to keep it straight. I have a question. Yes. For, um, because I have called. Car legal a couple of times, and what I was told is like if there is a dispute, whatever agent calls, and obviously they give you a case number, has the more favoritism than the other. Is no favoritism is just it's just conflict of interest. That's all. Okay. So when you when the you one that calls first has more leeway, or I guess no, or no, it's just conflict of interest. So. What they tell people is that, and I don't understand, I don't really understand it from Carr's perspective, really. I mean, because I think what it is 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 not so much conflict of interest because they can refer you to another attorney, right? Uh, within Carr, I think what it is is that they don't want to give conflicting advice because what happens is that an agent calls them and gives them the best possible scenario for them. Another agent calls them and gives them the best possible scenario for them. Well, if you give the best possible scenario for your side, of course they're going to tell you, "Hey, you're going to win," right? So they don't, they don't like to talk to, 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 to two agents on, on the same transaction, opposite, opposing agents. Okay. So it's not because of favoritism. It's just they can't, they don't want to give conflicting information. Does that make sense? Yes. It's the same for me. Like if you, if, Ke if you know, Keller Williams, um, you know, if, if, if the lakes called me, like if Sophia called me and says, hey, John, I have this issue with Keller Williams Rancho. I'm like, whoa. Let's see if we can resolve it without getting too formal here, right? Because Ranch was one of my clients. So that's the same thing. Okay. No, no, no. You were talking about the father's uh, answer, answer question. I just want to later on before you go. I want to I want you to tell the agents what the number one um, situation you see agents getting in trouble for, like legally. And then I want them, I think the office, uh, our compliance officers here, I would like her to speak on some of the things that she, you think our agents will benefit from learning. Like for me, there, I always tell them, do not waive the home inspection. And um, and then I, I, about the AVID, I think we, we have no clarity on what they should and shouldn't write on the AVID. So I would like you to touch on that later, but go ahead. Okay. So in the, in the classes that we teach for new licensees, we're being told that the phrase as is could invalidate a contract. Do you have any opinion on that? It's in the contract. It says in the, in the RPA, it says as is. Is it, but the issue, but the issue about it as is, is that it's it's um, it's subject to full disclosure by the agent and seller of what they know. Okay. So the, the phrase they're asking us or, or instructing us to put in our contract is: it's not being sold as is; it's being sold as disclosed. Yes. Isn't it, did they change it to as disclosed in this contract? I, I have not. Okay, because <laughs> it used to be as is in here. <laughs> I don't, I don't okay. as is. It's not in there anymore. Okay, well, that's good. That's another change that I, I missed. It's good to know, but yeah, but you're right. So essentially, the reason they're saying that is because maybe people are getting confused about what the law actually is, right? Um, so the law is is that you can say as is as much as you want, but if you don't disclose that there's a there's a the hole is sink the, the the house is sinking into you know into the ground, you know. Yeah, yeah that's good. Because, uh, <laughs> listen to this. Uh, when I go this home, they'll tell me that you the seller will say. I want to sell it as is. I'm not fixing anything. So you as a professional, I tell them, okay, um, you cannot say as is because I, I saw a publication that came out years ago when I was doing um, grievance committee at the board. And um, I was like, so I just saw the seller. You just, you can, 
you you have to disclose all you know, and then whatever they ask for, you, at that time you can litigate. But you huh. can't just say um, you can't withhold knowledge about the property hmm. and just say I sold it as this. They're screwed with whatever they got. That's, yeah. that's, well, what what as it what, what as is me what what as it what as is means to me is that they won't they won't fix. Yeah. So if the seller says I'm selling it as is, the whole the, you know, the roof is leaking in 15 different spots. Just and, then, and then the buyer says, well, I want you to fix the roof. Nope, I'm not fixing it. I'm so selling it. Their favorite phrase. And, and as disclosed. I like as disclosed. What is it? <laughs> right? I'm mean, telling as is. Yeah. You still have to tell the roof leaks. So the whole that's, actually, that's actually good to, to make that. The, because people don't know that, right? People don't know that California law is just full disclosure sometimes. So the as is, okay, then I can just do whatever. No, the issue is you got California got to disclose. It's actually the number one issue between jurisdictions. Yeah. Believe it or not, like California, the, the, disclo the full disclosure thing in California is not that old. It's like the 70s. I mean, I know that you guys are young, but I, I look, I was born in the 70s. So I'm, I'm not saying it's old, but it's old. But, but it's not like 100 years old. It's only from the 70s, okay? So, so but, uh, but other, other jurisdictions don't have that. So when people ask me to review like a purchase agreement for like, you know, Nevada or Arizona or somewhere else, right? I just, somebody asked me to review a document from Illinois and I'm like, I have no idea if as is means, actually means as is in Illinois, right? Because some, some of those jurisdictions are buyer beware. You do your disclose, you do your full investiga investigation, but if you don't catch it, it's your problem. You know, it used to be like that in California until in the seventies they changed. Is buyer beware. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I t is it safe? I tell I tell sellers that they could sue you for everything you don't tell them. So, but you're more protected if you tell them. So tell them everything. Exactly. Yeah. Tell them everything. Tell, write everything down when I leave. Walk in your house. Everything. And if something comes up after you filled out the TDS, if something else comes up, you can call and actually amend it and add more to it. But that's the other thing I want you guys not to be robots on. Okay. If the seller tells you something, and then you see a TDS or an SPQ, it doesn't flag it. For example, you know, uh, are there problems with your, you know, there's a problem with my fence. I think it's leaning. I think it's going to be on the, the, the neighbor's property, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a, there's a checkbox for that, right? It says, do, do you have any issues with fencing or, you know, border line, boundary lines? If the, if the checkbox is no, then you want to go back to your client because you're not a robot. You're not looking at these things in a vacuum. You want to go back to your client and say, you told me last week that you had an issue with the fencing. Like, why did you mark no? Because that's your job. Right. <laughs> yes, guys. So that's the num that's the number one thing agents get in trouble for, <laughs> Sophia. Is not is acting like a transaction is <clears throat> like you turn on a car and you drive, and then you don't get off on any on ramps, and you go from like A to Z, and then you're done. Right. That's not the way real estate transactions work. Sometimes you have to make a U turn. Sometimes you got to make a left or right. It's not a freeway. It's like a bunch of streets. If you get inconsistent information from your client, you have to. Flag it, bring it up. So if they don't want to pressure, but they know about it, how do you go about it as an agent? Well, the question, my question would be, why don't they want to correct it, right? I, I, like, so are you telling me that you want to withhold this because you want to sucker the other side of this? Like, I want to know their thought process because it may not be somebody you want to work with if, yes, if, exactly. if, if, they're, that, if they're that conniving about it. Yes. But let's assume it's a simple thing. Like, hey, you know, I'm not going to, you know, you do what you need to do. I'm not going to correct it on my paperwork, fine. Put it on the oven. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> or put it, or any disclosure works. It doesn't have to be the doesn't have to be the avid. It could be any disclosure. You know, any disclosure. Right. Um, by the way, the law is the law is pretty clear that even if a TDS or an SPQ goes out, and then the buyer gets information that something is wrong with the SPQ and TDS, you don't have to change them because the buyer has knowledge of it right now, so you don't have to change it. So, for example. The seller says uh, the roof is fine. You know, the roof is fine. There's nothing wrong with the roof. No issue with the roof. But the roof leaks. The buyer then knows that the roof leaks before they close escrow. You don't have to change the you don't have to change the document. You're fine. The buyer knows about it. So disclosure. It's disclosure. So once the buyer knows, you're good, right? Yeah, and um, just so you guys know, I want to uh, throw in a plug. Um, next week on Wednesday. Um, we have a class and it's not free because we're bringing in a, an actual instructor. Um, we're, the office is paying half, you're paying the other half. I want you to have skin in the game so you don't walk out of the class. I need $25. There's she only 40 seats. Seat. There's only 25. Um, there's only an amount of seats available. So please, before you leave today, sign up with 
Kirsten today. And, and it's on the Facebook page. Yeah. It's on the Facebook. Um, the masterminds group, um, it was emailed and it was texted. <laughs> that link that you click on will, it'll take you straight to the registration. Yes, yeah, so that's on Wednesday because then everything that he's saying, like that way, I just, uh, like, like John is right. Like as professionals, one of the main things you have to know is the contract. Read it, know what's in it, understand it thoroughly. That's your job to, you could properly explain it because all these disclosures, all these things that he's saying, it is very important because he represents, he's a litigation attorney, right? So he, he knows, he, he gets, Realtors out of trouble a lot, right? Or into trouble a lot. So, um, so, so please um, make sure who's going to be here next Wednesday. Raise your hand. Right? Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, but uh, everyone's on the contract, and you know, just, um, we're speaking about the uh, mediation and mediation of going to small claims. There is the bond for that. It says that you would go to mediation yeah, first, yeah, but you're just yeah, finished saying that it would not. If you, if you actually look at the contract in a second, I don't know. What section is it in in uh, in, in the new in one? The new one? <laughs> it used to be it used to be twenty two, right? Yeah. Yeah. So no. So uh, so the so the reason is the deposit. My in my case, it's just annoying because like I know for like I'm gonna go to they're gonna go to court and more than likely my client gets a ten thousand dollars back. But it's just the principle of, of having to go to court to pay for it. Like you know what I mean? Like now, who do you think she's upset at? So what's the purpose of clicking on the box? But because if the deposit is more than ten thousand, oh. they have to they have to go to mediation. Yes. Mediation is it hard? Mediation is not free. It costs three hundred fifty dollars. And just so you know, CAR has a resource. They used to provide it as a service to board of realtors. They stopped doing that in twenty twenty. So they no longer offer mediation at the local boards. Now you have to go through an attorney. So when you there's a web there's a link on the California Association of Realtor website, CAR.org. Where it gives you a preferred list of attorneys that do mediation, they start at $250 an hour. All right, so here's so if it's under 10000 like it's not worth it, just go to some sales court. If it's over 10000 you have to. But the so, Martin Robles also said that she paid, and Jamie, they said they paid to the board that they're going to come specifically pay again for Barbara. Oh. Because she's the best instructor, yes. Yeah. So here's that. Here's the clause that's the, so referring to. It's actually section 31 now. 31B. The following matters are excluded from mediation or arbitration. Any matter that is within the jurisdiction of the probate, small claims, bankruptcy, unlawful detainers, so on and so forth. So essentially, essentially that anything within the within the within the um, jurisdiction of the small claims court is excluded from mediation and arbitration. I found I found it on the ground. Is that supposed to be here? Yeah, yeah, it's not on the ground. Okay. When I gave it to him, it was on there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's because it's because it's so expensive to mediate and arbitrate. All right, let's talk about tenancy real quick. All right, tenancy. Tenancy. All right, so tenancy is a is still an issue right now. I mean, with with uh, with different jurisdictions, LA is impossible. Just so you guys know, LA County is is better than LA City. LA City, forget it. You know, you're not gonna be able to evict anybody until like March. LA County is a little bit is more restrictive. Uh, that, than, than here. What it is in, in Riverside and San Bernardino County essentially is, is that it's still a pain in the ass to get people out for non-payment of rent. If you want to evict based on non-payment of rent, it's, it's a pain. There's a lot of red tape to do that. So what I recommend the landlords right now, if they want to evict the people, even if they're not paying rent, is provide a 60-day notice if they've been there longer than a year. So if, people, if, if the tenant's been there longer than a year, they're, re, they're required to give a 60 days notice, 6-0, you can evict much faster based on that and much smoother. So that's what I would do. Because right now, as of October, it reverted back to the old law. And the old law said, you don't have to give a reason anymore for 60-day notices. Okay? So unless something changes soon, I would do the eviction based on a 60-day notice and no reason has to be given on the notice. Okay? So that's, that's in a nutshell what my recommendation is to landlords right now. because. If you try to evict based on non-payment of rent, you're going to have to show that they, the tenants applied for uh, rental assistance, that the landlord applied for rental assistance, that you give proper notices, that you, you know, every, I mean, it's just so much red tape. It's just impossible to prove all that. It's just difficult. So 60-day notices can still be used for anybody over a year. If they're if been there under a year, it's a 30-day notice. Okay. Commercial property is 30-day notice, okay, as long as there's no lease. So if you have an ongoing lease, the lease 
is the final word on the tenancy, right? So if you have a year lease until you know August of 2023 or whatever, then you can't evict on a 60-day notice or any kind of notice because the lease, the lease is the governing document for the for the tenancy. So you can't terminate the tenancy based on a 60-day notice. But if it's a month to month, you can terminate. Okay, make sense? Yes. Can I ask you on Zoom, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, first one. What will be the next step if after giving the 60-day notice, the tenants don't leave? Right, so then you have to file an action, an unlawful detainer action. Unlawful detainer action. Yeah, so which is a legal, which is a legal action, to try to you know to to evict the tenants legally through a through a complaint. What was it called? Unlawful detainer. With a U, unlawful detainer. I think let me answer the next one too, because the other realtor said um, sixty day notice given, but tenants were not moving and have decided to stop paying rent. They are saying they don't have the money because they needed to move. What is my client's next move? What's the time frame for that? So is it Riverside County? Is it Riverside County, Martha? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, the, one, of the, one of the moves you can do is to try to entice them to move quicker by, give it, by, by giving them cash for keys. Okay, so that's something that you may want to you may want to think about because cash for doing cash for keys and things like that is still always on the table. So if you, you want to have the tenant move out whenever, if you give them money and they agree to it, you can you can have them move. If if they want a crazy amount of money or they won't move for whatever reason, then you have to file an action for unlawful detainer. And Riverside County is still taking about forty five days. And, but, understand something, guys. Unlawful detainer. All the cases all the cases are like backed up. Okay, so right now when I file an unlawful detainer in, in Riverside County, it's taken us two weeks to get it back from the court. So everything is backed up. Everything, it's a, it's, a, it's a general disaster out there. It's a mess. It's a real disaster out in the real world, unfortunately. For the cash for key, what's like the best way to do that? Like what would be your process? Like, what would be that? You got to find leverage, right? So I would, I would suggest sending a 60-day notice first. And the leverage would be, hey, if you're not going to agree, I'm going to hire an attorney and we're going to evict you and you're going to have an eviction on your record. Probably before that, everything is just talk. Right. If you just threaten th something and you don't do it, and they just think it's just you're just bluffing, you have to have some leverage, right? Now you may have some very good people as tenants, and they may say, be truly saying to you, "Hey, I can't move unless I have some money. Uh, can you help me out?" And maybe you want to help them out and just leave it at that. You know? But you know, I've seen families you know fight over it, possession. I mean, I've seen. Kids trying to evict their mother. I've seen mothers trying to evict their kids. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. When does a three-day lockdown come out? Say again? When does a three-day lockdown come out? When does a three-day lockdown come out? Paraquit or the lockout? Okay, paraquit is different than lockout. Okay, she said lockout. Lockout. Okay, so she's talking about a sheriff, right? So the sheriff, once the unlawful detainer action is, is there's a judgment for the for the plaintiff, for the for the landlord, then the sheriff gets involved. And at that point, the sheriff would go out to the property, say, hey, we have a judgment against you to move. They'll give them like three to, three to five days to get their stuff out and move, and they'll come back probably within two weeks and not really three to five days because they're backed up too to try to, to get them out of the house. Mm. They actually will lock them out. I've been at lockouts before. They'll, pe they'll drag people out. <laughs> but their stuff is still there, so they'll uh, tell the landlord to work it out with them regarding their stuff. Does this apply to if someone has a vacation house and then someone decides to stay past the No, period? it's different. Vacation renters are different. Yeah. <laughs> totally and, different. Well, yeah, what, what can you speak on our agents um, as far as when they told the app it, um, what, what is the proper way to do it? Because I have a compliance officer here. What's the proper way to do it? Um, what, what's the, so what's the issue the that you guys are... What's the issue uh, you guys see? Uh, you, you get, so you're only supposed to write um, any conditions that you see staying on wall. Right. Um, a lot of our agents, like, mine is blank because when I start, when I was a new agent, I, I would just write everything. Beautiful kitchen, <laughs> like, like new cabinets, because you don't know, right? And then my clients have to pull me aside back then and said, whoa, Sophia, you did not do it. You're only supposed to disclose. So I want to make sure that it comes from you. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the proper way? What should they be putting on there? What should they not be putting in there? And their agent visual disclosure because that, that's that's their proof that they walk to the property that that, that, that protects themselves from the seller. Yeah? yeah, I mean, I think that you, you do you definitely have to do one right, do one properly. Don't just like go to your client's house and shoot the breeze for half an hour and move and go out and say nothing noted on every single space. 
because it's pretty hard to it's hard, hard to imagine that any house has nothing noted. Even new houses have problems, right? So I want you to, I want you to actually look at the house and note something. You know, you don't have to say a beautiful kitchen because what well, who cares? Okay. It is, but the home inspection is limited by the avid in, in the same way, and that you guys have no obligation to move stuff. Okay. okay, so you don't have, you don't have, you don't, you, there's no reason for you to go in the attic. There's no reason for you to move a dresser to see if the wall is warping or something. Obviously, if, if you see. Right, they saw what happened? The water damage. Was it still in escrow? Okay, so that's good. Sometimes, sometimes it closes and something like that happens. But then, so then the issue, the legal issue is that it's not black and white because it comes down to disclosure. Did the seller know something to disclose? Was was there something obvious? She actually did disclose it. She had an insurance claim, but it was a room to where the claim was. Gotcha. So it was an issue that the insurance company really hired and they do a good job. Yeah. Because it was old, it wasn't Yeah, those cases are tough. Those cases are tough because you know. Again, the, the, the seller liability comes out of the seller liability comes out of knowing something and not telling the other side. So if the seller doesn't know, like I had, I had a this is a great example, right? I had a case three or four years ago. A, sell, a buyer came to me and says, you know, we were remodeling and we were we were opening up walls and we saw it was furry behind the wall, like it was it was literally like mold everywhere, just fur. And I'm like, well, why didn't you see that when you were walking the house? He goes, well, nobody could see it when I was walking the house. It was behind the wall. I said, well seller wouldn't see it either. So can you prove that the seller would know something, right? It was a pinhole leak behind the wall. There was no obvious exterior anything. You can't prove a seller knew that, right? It's not affecting their water bill. It's a small, small thing. It's been going on for years, right? It's not warping the wall. It's just kind of like just in the framing. What are you gonna do, right? What are you gonna do? Unless, unless you can prove that the seller did remodel, and saw it and then covered it up. How are you going to prove that stuff? Yeah, why would you do that? Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Jacqueline, what, all, what, are the, what are the things that you've seen on the compliance side that you can So, uh, for example, for an hour, I notice the buyer perform. Um, and if, when they are served, I notice the buyer perform. If it asks for like a specific contingency, like say it was appraisal. Right. But by the time they get back to responding, loan contingencies. Now do. Does that notice the buyer to perform only apply to the appraisal contingency, even though the loan contingency is up? Mm -hmm. so they, they have to send you a new. Yeah, if it's very specific, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I mean, if I was, I mean, yeah. it's very, spe it's very specific. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, that's why one of the reasons why they changed everything to 17 days essentially is because they just want to send something. One, one document says remove all. <laughs> They lowered everything to 17 days from the 21. It used to be 21 days long. Yep. You get another, right? Yeah. And the days. Oh, sorry. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. It's it, same thing with the expired form. They're sending over cancellation within 40 hours instead of 40? 48 okay. hours. So, like, if they said it Monday at you know, noon, I count that as day zero. Yeah. And then they have day one, two. Correct. So, midnight on Wednesday. Well, they're sending over cancellation news. Not our agent, but another agent saying we're canceling news on Wednesday. I'm like, no, they have till midnight to remove that contingency. Mm. Is that? Am I saying correct? I just want to make sure. I mean, because it's kind of great. I would. Well, not Wednesday though, because Monday's Monday's day zero. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday would be the cancellation. Okay, they can send it over even at twelve o'clock. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Because they're eight. We have one where an agent got a cancellation Wednesday. If it's improper, it's improper. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, if they're not counting days correctly, I'm I'm, I'm afraid for their business. Okay. <laughs> but the, the, the thing, what okay. I quote: hey, If they can't count days correctly, I'm. Hey, what is it which thing? I'm afraid for their I'm business. Afraid for the business, hey, info. I like that. One. <laughs> um, but 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 if it's if it falls on a Sunday or something, or falls on a uh, on a Sunday or a Saturday, the second day. It, it kicks over to the next business day. Yeah, so they would have Monday until midnight. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
I just want to make sure I'm explaining it correct because when we get questioned on other sides, I'm like, right. oh, that's not what it is. But then yeah. I question. <laughs> Well, with, with emails now, with emails, like it's almost instantaneous, right? So, I mean, the, the old days used to be everything had to be by mail or fax or something, and that was more difficult to do. Yes. So, what happens if, uh, let's say, you get into a lawsuit, you sue the other party, and they have to respond, right? Or what if, what if the stuff is taken Yes. Like, like, are you talking about, like, just general lawsuit? Yeah, or like anything with, like, a buyer, like, let's say, like, uh, uh, somebody is, like, they get into a lawsuit. Or would that be considered a lawsuit, like a small claims court? Yeah, this is just a small claims lawsuit. Um, and then they have to respond, but do they have to legally respond, or can they just not respond at all? And then well, well, small claims is a little bit different, because in small claims court, you don't have to send anything. You can just show up on a day of trial. So small claims is, a little, is, is different than regular court. But in regular court, like for civil, like civil court in downtown Riverside or whatever, if you get sued and you don't do anything, you're going to get a judgment against you by default. What's that? Oh, like you lose. Like you lose. We lose without saying anything. <laughs> and if they get a judgment against you without in default, they can put a lien against your house and do all kinds of nasty stuff. Uh, and then for you, for that person to respond, does it cost them money? Oh yeah. And, and is that like a big chunk? Like, do they have to get an order? Well, I mean, they don't have to get a lawyer. I mean, you know, you can do your own surgery too. But the thing is, is <laughs> well, uh, not, not, so, not, being so, not being so dramatic, right? I mean, you, you can represent yourself, but, uh, but yes, it costs money. I mean, even if, even, if you, even if you represent yourself, if you have to file it, when you file the answer in, in court, it's $435 just to file it. All right, I love that, John. Awesome. All right, does anybody have any other questions for Mr. John? You go all the way from Rancho to be here. All right. Yes. And, um, John, in what case would you would we refer a client to you? Could, they could hire you to represent it or something? Well, we do everything. So, essentially, if, if you guys have a buyer seller dispute, um, disclosure, whatever, where there's no conflict of interest with you guys. You know, sometimes uh, I'll get clients of yours and, you know, um, I may think to myself, well, the agent could have done something better. In that case, I just decline because I, I represent you guys, right? So if you refer me somebody, it's fine. It's just make sure there's no conflict. There's no, there's no animosity between you and your client, right? <laughs> um, so I'm happy, I'm happy to help them if, if they really need help. You know, we do evictions. Uh, we do, um, you know, non-disclosure cases. Oh, we, we, we do evictions? Yeah. Oh, okay, we do. I mean, we do, we do it. It's, it costs more than it would with a fast eviction company, but we do it if people want to use us. Uh, we do um, quiet title. You guys know what that is? Uh, you know, that, how would that be? Another question. What is a quiet title? Okay. So sometimes people do weird things on their title and they add people to title that are gone. You see a lot of that when back when the, you know, the... Yeah, um, so the modification stuff was going on. So they added a bunch of people just to avoid for avoid foreclosure. And now that the properties have actually gained value, they're trying to sell the property and the title's like, nope. Where's where's Joe Smith to try to sign off on your title? He owns 1%. <laughs> and then it was like, well, everybody knows that Joe Smith was just, just a fictitious person, Mr. Title Company. And the title company's like, so? <laughs> so you got a quiet title. You got to file an action to clear your title. I think my question was a little bit different. Okay. Um, <laughs> Your question was very broad. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was going to know it. Let's see, two parties have the deed, the property paid for. Partition. So, yeah. So one part of the other owner can they have yes. their part yes. without the other party knowing? Yes. As long, so as long, no, not without the party knowing. But as long as, it, if it's not family court, meaning a husband and wife always goes to family court, right? So in other, other circumstances, like domesticated, domesticated partners and stuff, all that stuff goes to family court. So if it's husband and wife, family court. But I have a lot of cases where it's not husband and wife, it's boyfriend and girlfriend, it's kids and parents, it's uncle and whatever. Those cases are called partition cases. And they are actions that we have in our office and we file them to divide up the property. And, the, and those cases are, are um, you have to give the other side notice. So let's say, can that other person that holds 50% of the property give trust that 50% off to their trust in their trust? Sure. Okay. Without the other party? So 
there's something called joint tenancy, yes. right? Joint tenancy means people are holding the title in such a way where if one of them dies, the other person gets it automatically. But I never recommend joint tenancy for people who are not married because of the because of that reason. So, but you can always sever the joint tenancy anyway. So essentially, I've seen situations where joint tenants they get you know the boyfriend girlfriend the boyfriend moves out the girlfriend moves out. What they do is they just deed their half of the property to something else to somebody else or their own trust that severs the joint tenancy makes it tenancy in common. So it's possible. It's possible. Oh, of course, it's more than possible. It's, it's absolute. <laughs> but it's, a, it's an undivided. <coughs> Joint tenancy is an undivided interest. When you when you sever it and go to tenancy in common, then it's, it is a divisible interest. So, Sophia could have that half on that wall. I can have this half. Well, the 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 answer to your question, Phil, is that these laws were on the, on the books like 150 years ago when all you talked about is raw land with no mortgages, right? So yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense for houses, but the reality is, is that one co-owner cannot, cannot um, exclude another owner. So on paper, it's divisible interest because essentially you can see 50-50, right? I mean, you can see it, it's divisible interest. But most of the time, if, it, if it's tenancy common, but most of the time, yeah, you cannot exclude somebody from one half of the house or the other. Because it's a, it's a house. By the way, when we file a partition action to sell the property because of people, you know, we actually have to say in the le old legal legalese, they say, this is a single family house and we cannot divide it because it, the default for partition is division, right? Meaning essentially you have a 10 acres, we're going to divide it five acres each and you guys go to, you know, we can't do that with a single family home. And by the way, the, the, the lender won't let you do that anyway. <laughs> so they're going to force you to sell the house. Right? So yeah, it's un, undivided is a kind of a fiction. It's kind of a fictitious thing that we, and we see that pop up quite a bit. abide by. <laughs> but you're right. It says undivided interest. Yeah, you're right. Well, okay, so I'm going to say something here that may, have, may blow all your minds, sir, okay? You ready? You ready? The only elements for transferring property is execution by the grantor, intent by the grantor to transfer, delivery by the grantor, and acceptance by the grantee. Wow. Did you hear anything about recording there? No. no. It could be a paper. Recording is not necessary to transfer property. But what about other people trying to have the house on the market, and they're like, well, it's going to sell Well, but you just, you just hit on it, right? So the reason why people record is because they want to give notice to the world that they own, they own the property. Um, so if someone drunkenly writes on a piece of paper, I give you my home, can you use it? No, <laughs> no. Because <laughs> a, 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 notary, a notary will never... <laughs> a, a notary will never notarize that document. <laughs> And it should be notarized, so but it does not have to be recorded. Right. And the fee is valid from the date that it's signed and notarized. And, and, del and, deliver and delivered and accepted. Probably not.
Uh, no, another state? Well, you have to send, you have to send a notary over. <coughs> yeah. 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 So the, the document doesn't have to be married. Like they could write notarize one, notarize one, and they get married in escrow. They don't get the exact same form, correct? Yeah. 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 You can hire someone to show up there inside. You have to hire a notary to go there. Yeah, and then, and then they have to get permission to the. I've done it. Yeah. Get permission well, to the. The notary will always speak with a lawyer. Oh, is that the one? No, no, it's the lawyer. Yeah, it's Well, I've talked to her. I mean, she's. It's kind of a weird situation over there. I talked to her. <laughs> I talked yeah. to the. I talked to the notary. Yeah. Yeah. That's still going on, huh? She didn't. We're we're so so grateful to be in business with thank you. you. Oh, thank you. You're guys. amazing, John. Because he we have he has our back so. Throughout the year, when you guys have scenarios, you come to near Phil, and then we help you. If not, we'll call him, and you know we'll help you. And these guys are very uh, smart guys, so I would probably listen to them before me. If, <laughs> you know, one thing one thing about me is, although I have my broker's license, I'm not day to day like these guys are in the business. So these guys are much more in tune with what's happening out there than I am. Sophia yeah, and Phil. They're seasoned. They're seasoned. <laughs> Salty. <laughs> I get a lot of scenarios. Salty. <laughs> I like that. The set prevailing party pays the uh, gets the attorney fee. So if somebody loses, they don't pay nothing. If somebody loses, they gotta pay their attorney fees plus the other side's attorney fees under the contract. Uh, okay. So yeah, yes, go ahead. And see. <laughs> winning though. I'm sorry. Prevailing means prevailing means win. Yeah. 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 So if someone sues someone frivolously, because that's the case with me. Like I, what I do is like not then I'll file file a case to get reimbursed for attorney fees for for filing for the lawsuit. You wasted your time, and you had to incur costs. So normally, it's actually decided in the main case. You don't have to file anything else. Yeah, it's yeah. decided in, my yeah. in the mail case. What's the dumbest thing you've seen a broker? Oh my god! <laughs> the dumbest thing you've seen a broker get in trouble for? Yeah, so we don't do it. Huh? Top two things I've seen realtors get in trouble for. Uh, no, commonly is different than top two worst <laughs> things. Or no, we said dumbest. <laughs> uh, dumbest. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, um, probably just uh, like a, a like a a really bad non-disclosure, like the agent saying something I didn't know uh, this was happening, and and you know they have like notes and emails saying it was happening, kind of thing. Okay. I've, seen, I've seen that you know i had one where it was like a, a roof leak or something and and, and the um the agent says nobody told me there's a roof leak like why would i disclose it and literally she there was there was an email picture her getting wet there was a, there was an email there was a, there's an email between her and her client her client telling her hey there's a roof leak you might want to tell the other side wow. <laughs> yeah that's bad yeah wow what's like the biggest stuff right now like what have you seen in the last year it's like going through court or going through law. Um, you know, I, I the last in the last year, I, you know, so, some of the cases that I've seen are not great for the plaintiff side. Like they'll, there's a lot of attorneys who file cases not understanding the law exactly, like how how they can reach, how can how they can get to the to the agents and sue them. So they are kind of suing just because the seller didn't disclose something. I mean, that, that's I've seen a lot of that recently, and I you know that's just bad lawyering not understanding the law because really what it, a lot of this stuff comes down to eventually I mean, you know a lot of it is buyer seller issue so for example i've seen like attorneys want to sue the the agent for non-release of deposit i'm like well what does the agent have to do with it yeah. like what what are they supposed to do hold a gun to the seller's head and and, and have them <laughs> release the like what? so those kind of things i've seen which are kind of you know dumb from the attorney perspective yeah <clears throat> All right. Anything else? I know I need to talk to my, my man over here. Anything else? You can always email me and whatever else. Oh, by the way, just real, so I can touch on this real quick. Oh. As far as gifts, when somebody gives a gift and you're married and you get it, say I uh, gave a gift to my son or whatever, he's married, uh -huh. it's totally for him, right? As far as uh, property goes. You're talking about your clients? Gifts to your clients? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Oh, okay. Uh, my son's married, yeah. I have a property that's paid off. So okay. I give it to him, but instead of just, I just want to get this one and it's notarized and everything's done. That's Inheriting, maybe? Well, uh, just a gift. It's, I mean, from, from, from my side of the equation, everything is fine, but uh, you may want to talk to a tax attorney about if there's an excellent gift amount and taxes and things like that. But 
from my perspective, not being a tax, not being a tax attorney or a CPA, you can gift whatever you want. But, but I'm saying that like, you have full rights to the property even if you're married. Right? Oh, absolutely. Well, you gotta. One thing you gotta be careful of when you when you're dealing with married people is if there's if there's still a mortgage or something on the property, for example, um, you gotta make sure that if it's a separate interest that the money to pay the mortgage is not coming out of a joint account. I mean, California is a community property state, so you can establish community property very easily. So if it's a gift to your son only, he, he's got to keep it separate. He's never going to use, he never has to, he can never use any community assets to pay for anything. Right. Yeah. Like property tax and they're not being paid with community. Exactly. You use the word commingle, which is nice, which is commingled. <laughs> so. I'm not a family law attorney, but, you, but I think she would have rights of some kind, for sure. <laughs> It's a, it's a community property state, so act ac act accordingly. I'm sorry. I want to make sure she's a good girl before I can. There's a couple of things I want to touch on real quick. So the uh, there's a lot of there's some issues that have come up regarding um, fire, you know, fire area for houses and stuff like that. Um, you know, they kind of clarified here on the, some of the new laws that the NHD is not going to be very specific on certain things. So if it's an issue about, um, you know, certain very specific things that, that are supposed to be disclosed, I wouldn't rely on the NHD. Uh, you need to ask your title company for very specifically, hey, is this in a, in a what is it called, a hardened um, you know, fire area or not? You, know, you have to ask very specific questions to your, to your title rep or, your, to your any, or to your NHD person about specific things. The NHD is very broad. It says kind of like fire district one or fire district two. I'm trying to remember the, the form, but be very specific with what you're asking your, your uh, NHD rep, okay? And get that in writing. So, so. I think, well, the problem is, is whether a disclosure is required by who, right? Who do we go to if we need to go to the fire agency? You can't, you're saying not, don't rely on the NHD. If the NHG doesn't know, they need to go to the fire, you know, fire department, fire agency, whoever, yeah, I guess, and get some more information. Yeah. Yep. How about some fire insurance company? Um, I, don't, I don't know what they, what do they, what do, they do? You, you have to have the inspection performed by the county or the local fire authority. And the first thing I found is Cal Fire. You can make a phone call and start asking the website as well. Their address in and request it, and if they deny, they sign up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, you can do the same thing with rent control in LA. I think there's a there's a website or or a text message you can send to the. So print print a copy of the website or take a snapshot photo yeah. to get your file. Yeah. Um, Orange County charges for their fire. Yeah. 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 Yeah.